Antibiotics were first mass produced in the 1940s and their ability to fight and kill bacteria revolutionized medicine and profoundly impacted everything from surgery to cancer survival to the productivity of agriculture, even to war. But after less than 80 years, these miracle drugs are failing. Resistant infections kill hundreds of thousands of people around the world each year, and there are now dozens of so-called superbugs. How did this happen? How did we squander something of such great value? Tonight, we are challenged to use our wits to turn the tide. Good evening and welcome. I'm Lynn Wicks. I'm the CEO of NPS Medicine Wise. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, who are the trad traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. NPS Medicine Wise is a not for profit company that receives funding from the Department of Health, the Australian Government, to improve the way medicines and medical tests are used. We're partway through a five year campaign to reduce antibiotic prescribing and reduce antibiotic resistance consequently. And we work with many agencies in a one health approach to this to solve a very serious public health problem. Next week is Antibiotic Awareness Week, a global event and call to action to preserve the miracle of antibiotics. Tonight we will provide a briefing on the importance of this issue and what we can do internationally and right here in Australia. So thank you for coming and I invite you to say a few words. Antimicrobial resistance is, as we all know, a significant global health priority and it affects us all. Antimicrobial medicines such as antibiotics are a precious resource used every day all over the world to effectively treat infections in humans and animals. They've enabled advances in modern medicine that would not otherwise be possible, and they contribute to our agricultural and food production industries. So the theme for Antibiotic Awareness Week, which starts next week, Antibiotics Handle with Care, reflects this overarching message that antibiotics are a precious resource and should be preserved. Australia has been participating in Antibiotic Awareness Week since 2012, and I'm very pleased that this year is officially the first ever World Antibiotic Awareness Week, formally endor endorsed by the World Health Organization. World Antibiotic Awareness Week aims to increase awareness of global antibiotic resistance and encourage best practice amongst the general public, health workers and policy makers to avoid the further emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance. And this event is a good opportunity to highlight exactly that. So thank you, Lynn, to your team at NPS Medicine Wise uh, for your ongoing efforts to improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance by consumers, healthcare professionals, and through effective communication, education, and training. Australia was pleased to support the endorsement of a global action plan to tackle the growing problem of resistance to antibiotics and other antimicrobial medicines at the 68th World Health Assembly in May 2015. Shortly following this, Minister Joyce and I released Australia's first national antimicrobial resistance strategy in June. Our departments are jointly convening a national forum next week as part of Antibiotic Awareness Week to discuss with stakeholders approaches for implementing the critical aspects of our national response. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'll now introduce our, our illustrious panel who are going to discuss a few of the issues in the Australian context for us. And if I could ask them to come to the front of the room. Uh, we have Pro Professor Chris Bagley, Australia's Chief Medical Officer. Thank you, Chris. Professor Peter Collignon, infectious disease physician and micro microbiologist at Canberra Hospital. Dr. Guan Yeo, a GP representative from the Royal Australian College of GPs. And Ms. Susan Andrews, the president of the Healthcare Consumers Association of the ACT. Thank you all very much for coming. I want to preface our, our panel by, by saying, first of all, it's not all doom and gloom because it feels a bit like that, especially after watching that very powerful documentary. 
There are some harrowing stories in, both in that film but also in the real lives of people in some of our hospitals. If we act now, we can slow and most likely reverse the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Reducing the environmental pressure caused by the overuse of antibiotics can allow the bugs to mutate back to something that our antibiotics can work on um, and hopefully antibiotics in the future will also be able to work on. And that's why the Australian government launched its national strategy earlier this year that the minister referred to, taking a one health approach that unites health, veterinary practice and agriculture. It's why the Australian Sa Commission for Safety and Quality of Healthcare are, are so committed to working on antimicrobial stewardship. And it's why at NPS Medicine Wise, we've set ourselves a target to reduce antibiotic prescribing in primary care by 25% in five years. We've just entered the year four of that campaign, and the interim results are looking promising. We are seeing fewer antibiotics being prescribed per, per GP encounter now in primary care, and we're starting to see shifts in the, cons in the attitudes and beliefs of consumers, especially regarding the use of antibiotics for conditions such as res respiratory infections. It's exciting to have that national antibiotic strategy. It's also I think very important that we, want, that we do have a One Health approach. How did you get all the stakeholders on side? I mean, how difficult was that? Because I think that's something that is instructive for all of us in terms of this being a, a, broad, a broad community issue. Uh, Lynn, thank you for that. And uh, I thought I might actually, to the, to the audience, I might show them the, uh, the strategy and it's available online at the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources and other good bookstores, but uh, Australia has, we're just at the, a phase of a very long journey and I've got Peter Collignon sitting next to me here. He's been involved in many microbiologists, infectious diseases physicians, working with uh, agriculture, but, you know, the original work on Jetacar, have been really pushing this since the mid 90s. And I think the frustration has been, has been getting, uh, this put into action and I think that's one of the uh, phrases that we're using now. We need the awareness. We need an awful lot more people to be aware of this problem, which is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But the awareness needs to get into action, which is also what MPS is doing. So it hasn't been hard to get uh, our colleagues together to take the, this forward. Nonetheless, I think uh, general practice is more recently coming on board with this and there's a lot of work to be done there. I think with the surgeons we need to keep working because uh, the way they can and need to use antibiotics in relation to some operations. Uh, what I've been very impressed with is the, uh, the veterinary uh, surgeons are really coming on board and have been paying attention to this for some time. So we're just part of the journey. I think the momentum is really building. And like you, I'm not doom and gloom with this. There's an awful lot happening. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. When we look at the data around the world, Australia prescribes a lot of antibiotics compared to some countries. You know, if we look at the UK or Switzerland or Scandinavia and the Netherlands, what can we learn from those countries? Are, are there things that they are doing that we're not doing? Are there things that, I guess, at a, at a government and a, a health system level they're doing that we're not doing? I think particularly Scandinavia and Holland have got surveillance very well sorted out so they know which antibiotics they're using, they know when they get resistance and they can respond to that. I think that's really important. They're paying significant attention to the use of antibiotics in animal health. So, and I think they are the leading countries in the world. When you look at other countries doing a range of things, the UK, I mean, is a global leader in this, but they've got issues to sort out. Uh, the European countries, uh, the US, and the president of the US talks about antimicrobial resistance, and that's, and particularly in, in human health. So we can learn a lot from a whole range of countries, uh, but other countries can learn from us. You mentioned the Safety and Quality Commission. The National Safety and Quality Health Service Standards which includes standards on infection prevention and control and the stewardship or the, the, the taking care of the use of antibiotics, they're national standards which get accredited. And if you don't pass accreditation, this is all our public and private hospitals and the day procedure centres. If you don't pass accreditation, you really can't do your business. 
So we pr that regulatory approach is important. We also work closely with the uh, Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Management Authority in, in relation to, we tell them which antibiotics are of critical importance in human health. And uh, they pay attention to that in their regulatory process. So we are doing some world leading uh, uh, efforts uh, as well. And I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And I think if we do go to the video um, with uh, Mark Shipp, who's our Chief Veterinary Officer, he will tell us a bit about what we're doing in agriculture, which in fact is leading the world, I think. Hmm. So the situation in Australian agriculture is quite different to that from overseas. In Australia, most of our agriculture is extensive and based on pasture, and so we don't need to bring livestock into barns over winter, and so we have less call upon antibiotics to protect animals from infection and from uh, contaminated environments. In addition, we have high levels of biosecurity on our farms and nationally. Australia has a high level of biosecurity and on farm we have quality assurance programs and industry biosecurity plans which ensure that infection does not come onto farms and so there's less call for use of antibiotics. The second aspect to antimicrobial use in animal agriculture in Australia is that we have a strong regulator. The Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority ensures that antibiotics approved for use in animals do not contribute towards antimicrobial resistance in human health. This is one of the criteria considered when antibiotics are approved for use in livestock. As a consequence, antibiotics that are critical to human health, such as third generation cephalosporins, gentamicin and the fluoroquinolones are not generally available for livestock in Australia, whereas they are overseas. Antimicrobials are used for growth promotion in Australia, but they're largely from the ionophore coccidiostat group, and that, that is a group that is not used in human medicine and therefore does not contribute towards human health antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance passes from animals to humans when bacteria from the gut of an animal contaminates food products and is passed into the human food chain. So the challenge is to ensure that we reduce that human exposure. The primary way to do that is to ensure that we have very high levels of meat hygiene. And Australia, because we are a major exporter of meat, has a very high level of meat hygiene, probably a, a global the uh, leading level in terms of meat hygiene. So we prevent uh, bacteria getting onto the meat or onto the animal products. The second aspect is to ensure that uh, there's regular surveillance and we have the National Residue Survey which is looking for residues of antibiotics on Australian animal products. They regularly look at hundreds of uh, samples and publish those results to show that there is no antimicrobial uh, residues left on uh, uh, food products in the Australian food chain. It's just as important that we do this for imported foods and we have a program that tests foods coming across the border and targets foods that are more likely to contain antimicrobial residues and which may contribute towards antimicrobial resistance in the human population. I think we're very fortunate in Australia that we have very good levels of cooperation between industry and government and between the various sectors within government. So the cooperation that we have between the health and agriculture portfolios is an example to many countries around the world and one that is envied by, by many of our international uh, counterparts. I'm very happy to be able to work closely with the Chief Medical Officer in implementing the National Strategy for Antimicrobial Resistance in Australia. So we were very grateful to Mark for um, uh, filming that for us. He did that yesterday. He's travelling today and wasn't able to, to be part of the panel. I think it re reinforces for all of us that we really do need to buy Australian when it comes to <laughs> our, uh, our, food, our food supplies. So I'd like to go to you now as a consumer. And I was recently sitting with a group of health consumers who um, were acting as an pa advisory panel for me. And they challenged me to say, well, doctors should be doing the right thing. You know, doctors should be not writing prescriptions when they should not be writing prescriptions. But at the same time, we know from our surveys that 13% of people will admit that they go in and demand an antibiotic from their doctor. So, you know, where are we with this? What, where's the issue? Where's the accountability? Um, look, I think antibiotic resistance itself is a very complicated issue. 
I think there is a general perception in the community that antibiotics are still the magic bullet, the wonder drug. Um, and there are reasons for that um, in the sort of broader social and cultural milieu that we live in. Um, but I think that what's important here is that consumers generally, I think, need upskilling in the area of antibiotic resistance. It's not something, we're not experts in that field. Um, so I think that just as an aside too, um, when we're really unwell and our cognitive capacity may not be the best when in a consultation with a doctor, um, it can be particularly difficult to understand the treatment advice the doctor um, is giving us and even more challenging to ask the questions that we need to ask. So when it comes to understanding the implications of antibiotic resistance for our health care, as I said, we just need some upskilling. And this is an area, I think, where health literacy for consumers is, becomes very important. And by health literacy, I mean our ability to obtain, understand and apply um, information about our own health and the healthcare system. So health literacy, though, is also about good, good communication um, between a patient and the healthcare team. So, and acknowledging the sort of power differential in any doctor-patient um, relationship. So I think um, that as consumers, we need doctors to take the lead here as well and be aware of our situation and to have those interpersonal skills um, to explain clearly and respectfully what the options are for treatments, whether to use antibiotics or not. And if, um, I, I, you know, I would ask people to ask someone in their family, do they know the difference between a virus and a bacteria? Just that basic level. I think there's, you know, it's quite a challenge, I think. And I understand that challenge for, for um, clinicians. It is difficult. So I think, you know, the health literacy space has got a lot of, there's a lot of work being done around that. And I think it's, it's important. And so consumers do have a responsibility to become aware and educated as much as possible, but it's about how and when and the, the level of, you know, we're a diverse group, you know, widely differing levels of education and understanding and need for the information. So it's a real challenge to do that, but I'm sure that you're onto it. <laughs> as you say, it's quite complex, and mm. it's complex also because it's about the risk to you as an individual, and then also perhaps yes. the risk to the community. Yes. So, yes. We, so we do we do mix that up. When's the best time to do that then? So, in the doctor's surgery, yes, when you're having a consultation, but you may not may not be feeling well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When do we start this health literacy journey? Because I guess that's the challenge, isn't it? Because it's not something you might be thinking of or have giving priority to until you're sick. Look, I think there's no one simple answer. I think it's got to be an integrated approach. It's got to be community awareness. It's, I think doctor surgeries are a very, you know, apt and important place to have it. Now, whether it's in um, written pamphlet form, again, if you're sick or if you're there with sick kids, it's the last thing you want to be doing. Um, so I think it's got to be a partnership here with, with doctors and consumers, I think to work out the kind of information you need at the time. And of course, the sorts of interactions we're talking about require time, particularly in that consultation. And as we know, um, time isn't always what there's a lot of in a consultation. Um, we don't, we fund um, GP visits on a fee-for-service basis, you know, uh, throughput, rather than looking at the person centred care and the context of the care, and that can be very challenging. So, and I mean, social media is a good place, but not everyone has access to it. It's not appropriate for a lot of people, but, you know, there are, I think, many strategies. So it has to be a sort of well-integrated, and as I said, a partnership between the experts and, you know, consumers. Mm. Well, thank you for that, Sue. Yeah. So, Gwen, how do you respond to that? I guess you're the other side of the partnership as a GP. <laughs> And we know GPs in Australia do prescribe a lot of antibiotics, particularly for respiratory infections, and 
really, what, 90% of those are probably viral and um, even the other 10% may not benefit much from antibiotics. So where are GPs on this? I think all the, the RACGB certainly supports any movement to increase appropriate prescribing. And from the start of the NPS, RACGP has supported that. In fact, my prior involvement with, with you started at the time when you were National Prescribing Service. I think we need to recognise that the big artillery is largely done in hospitals. Uh, general practitioners, by and large, will deal with small fire, maybe medium artillery. However, we also recognise that in one week, two million Australians see general practitioners. So that can be quite an impact. We also know that over the years, prescribing has actually decreased in antibiotic. And interestingly enough, not just in antibiotic, but in all prescribing. So the prescribing rate per 100 encounters has actually dropped about 1% per year over more than 15 years, which is quite a bit considering the number of popula the population, as well as allowing for the great spike in CVS drugs, cardiovascular drugs. So that's quite, quite a bit of impact. I agree with um, the points that Sue has brought up. The difficulty about a consumer education program, I think, is that if you provide information at the time when it's not required, not much of it is absorbed. I mean, we are humans. We, we just do that. And I was wondering whether an additional focus might be on how to ask things. And the reason I say that is because I'm involved in teaching doctors, communicating with patients. And I often say half the time it's not what you ask but how you ask that's important. And that will get you the information that gets someone to open up and engage with you. I think the same occurs with consumers. So hypothetically, let's say if I was inappropriately prescribing an antibiotic, and if the patient knows that, hey, maybe there's something wrong with this one. If the patient were to ask me, why do I need antibiotics? Now, look at it from my point of view. If I've spent 10 or 15 minutes assessing you and coming to a conclusion that I need it, what do you think I'm going to say? I'm going to defend my decision. So I think we need to provide scripts that will bypass a confrontation. So if you ask me, for example, so with these antibiotics, how much faster will, will I get better? Well, that will give a different answer. And that then allows a movement, I think. Yeah? So how you ask is really critical at the time. I think that's a nice way in. I think we also have people from a lot of different cultures in Australia as well. Uh, th so we do have some issues with people, particularly who have had very different experiences of infection and antibiotics and medicine access in general coming to this country. Do you think that plays into the situation at all? I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. I think general practice is pretty culture rich, if I can say. And, and we know, for example, that more than half of the doctors who sit the specialisation exams of general practice are overseas trained nowadays at every exam. So it's a changing field all the time. I wonder whether the best way is to look beyond the culture. I mean, I, I assume what you're asking me is, what influences prescribing behaviour? Maybe we need to look beyond that and ask ourselves, what, how, does, how do humans make up decisions? In other words, a study of decision making may actually be more helpful. And I know, I mean, I've been involved in medical education for a number of years. Uh, we don't talk about heuristics. But if you go to finance and investment, there is a lot of emphasis on heuristics. Maybe because a lot of money rides on the decision. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that there's a recognition that the mind makes quick decisions and slow decisions. Quick thinking, slow thinking, and they're different. And I think if you can capture that, it might help. So some of the things that was referred to in the video, of course, was of fear. Now fear, emotions influence quick thinking. And then once we make that decision, we rationalize. So what I don't agree in the video is that fact that we can get rid of the uncertainty by providing a test. Well, that doesn't have, is not tenable in general practice. We can't get rid of uncertainty. It's part and parcel of uncertainty. You just, you don't get rid of it by more tests. You actually get rid of it by a different strategy of handling that. So I think it might be helpful to look at how the human mind works in decision making. Assuming all doctors are humans, <laughs> I think it'd be helpful to, to do that. Okay, that's a nice... I guess new approach, new way of thinking about it. Thank you for that. 
And Peter, you're, you're sitting in a hospital with um, all those um, nasty bugs and lots of intensive treatments. <laughs> it's very easy for us, I think, to blame hospitals, so to say, well, all those, all those resistant bugs come from hospitals, um, but certainly quite a few do. How are hospitals leading, I guess, the way in terms of how we really do, I guess, challenge the status quo? Well, I'm not sure hospitals do lead necessarily all the time. I think there's a whole lot of bad practices in hospitals that need to be improved. And I think one of the problems is we tend to lump everything together. I mean, if we look at the total amount of antibiotics that are used, for instance, the majority is not used in the human sector. If you look at the US figures, supposedly 80% are used in the agricultural sector. And even in Australia, it's probably, you know, 70%. Now, a lot of those are coccidiostats, but still, even if you look at the ones that are in the human classes, it'd still be more than what's used in people. But even when we look at the human sector, there's a lot more given in general practice than there is in hospitals. Now, I actually think one of the amazing things about infectious diseases is how we're surprised all the time. Um, I, I mean, I think there are some bugs that are just human-to-human -human transmission. Um, meningococcus, the pneumococcus, uh, Haemophilus influenza type B, for instance. We're all human-to-human -human transmission. And I think generally what we see in resistance is what happens with people, both in the community and, you know, blaming other sectors, I think, is a mistake. There are other bugs, though, where it's completely the agricultural sector. Salmonella, for instance, uh, Campylobacter. They aren't human to human transmitted, that's all. And there's a whole lot of ones that are greyer. And that's everything from Enterococcus to Staph aureus. I used to think Staph aureus was just human to human till I found out, well, animals have it as well. And now, in, in, for instance, in Holland, um, probably 30% of all hospital-acquired MRSA are acquired from an organism that was in the agricultural sector. And what's really interesting there is how we really have to have this One Health approach. Yes, it is an agricultural MRSA that's coming to people and causing infections. The original organism was actually a human one, but it was fully sensitive. And it acquired the resistance while it was in the agricultural sector and adapted. So all these organisms are going in a soup one way and the other. And I think it doesn't help when we're trying to blame either general practice, the hospitals or the agricultural sector, because the reality is a lot of them are going every direction. And it's what we do in all those sectors that are important. And it's what we do with clean water or not having clean water. It's what we do with good housing, for instance, makes a difference to how often you transmit infection. Tuberculosis went down well before we had drugs. It was because we had better nutrition and housing that stopped the spread. So physical barriers that help people protect themselves from infection um, infection control in hospitals, hand hygiene, um, making you know, better living spaces for people, changing, teaching changes in behaviour, having vaccines that work to stop, you know, all make a huge amount of difference. So all of this has got to be looked at in a whole One Health approach if we're really going to make a difference. Now, Australia, I think we're very lucky. We have low levels of resistance, despite having high levels of antibiotic usage in people. And what are the reasons for that? Well, I think pharmaceutical benefits and government regulation have got a bit of it because we don't use as much as the worst type antibiotics as some other places do. I think the fact that we don't import fresh meats, the fact that we effectively ban some antibiotics like fluoroquinolones, the ciprofloxacin drugs, we have the lowest resistance rates um, for those sort of antibiotics in our E. coli and salmonella in the world. And it's not because we've got the lowest use of antibiotics. And even our fluoroquinolone use is the same as the UK, for instance, but they've got a four times higher rate of that resistance. So I think all these things do interact, and I think there's evidence for that. A, a good ex I think what we really need to do is change the culture. Now, if I look at successful programs in Australia, drink driving, smoking, we have a quite a different mindset now than 25 years ago. You cannot do this overnight. And I think the Netherlands is a really good example. It has the lowest um, antibiotic consumption in people in, in the Western world, anyway, even lower than Denmark. They surprisingly had one of the highest usage of antibiotics in food animals in Europe. Um, they changed because farmers started getting MRSA and their children did, and that caused a public media exercise. And they also had a problem with um, resistant E. coli, what we call ESBLs, or third generation cuphosporin resistant E. coli, appearing in people and very much in all their food, animals and poultry. The government sort of said, you will decrease your antibiotics by 50% in five years. 
Well, they decreased it by 70% in three or four years. So there was a, my point of that is you can actually change without ruining things. But what there was a different mindset in one sector versus the other. I always assumed it would be the whole of society, but different pockets can have different cultures that need to change. And the reality is change happens because of life-threatening events, because of media focus, because, you know, you want to change things. Um, another good example how we've achieved, I think, a lot in Australia, and this is through the Quality and Safety Commission that my colleague here used to be the chair of, or the CEO, we have halved, or no, we've decreased by 60 or 70 per cent the number of golden staph or staph aureus bloodstream infections occurring in the healthcare setting over a 12-year period. It wasn't one thing in my view. And the good thing news about that, that wasn't just the multi-resistant MRSA, it was all the sensitive ones as well. So by having a whole lot of infection control approach, approaches, we have managed to get it down and we've done it where other countries haven't. By just focusing on, focusing on antibiotic resistance, the UK has got their MRSA rates down but haven't got the ordinary staff. While we've taken a more holistic approach and I think achieved that. And, and I think there's lots of things we can do and learn and we can do a lot better than we are now. I think that we, we keep hearing, hearing it's that holistic approach, all of us in this together, to really make a difference. I think that's, that's a really important message. I'm going to throw to each of you, and if there's one thing you could do in the next 12 months that you could see happen, what would you want it to be? I'll go to you first, Chris. Well, in spite of what Grant said, uh, we know that there is big international work on uh, producing diagnostics at the bedside. And it may take longer than 12 months, but if we could take that uncertainty out of the consultation, uh, if the doctor was able to say to the patient or the parent, you or your child has a viral illness, we've demonstrated that, that would make a big difference to prescribing. But you, Peter? What, what would you put your money on? Well, I'd like to see what I think is at least starting to be set up, a good surveillance system, data that's readily available to you know, all the st share stakeholders on how much antibiotic is used, what is used, where it is used, and also what resistance we're seeing in different sectors, so that you can use that to act in a quick way to change what's actually happening. For you, Guan, I'd like would you to like give to you see? a tip on how NPS medicine wise can be more effective yes, in the program. Thank you. I and like I have that. to say that when I refer to the drop in antibiotic prescribing by GPs, a lot of the credit goes to NPS medicine wise on that one. But the educational programs that the RACGP has endorsed, if you like, moving from a time when it was the first college to require to mandate CPD uh, to the time when it mandated reflective activity, and then it mandated to reflective activity, which you do very well. What it has now decided is to actually look at introducing peer review. Now, peer review has been a real problem in general practice because we don't have collections of large numbers of doctors in one location. So doing a face-to-face -face peer review is logistically very difficult and expensive and inconvenient. So stepping aside from that now, personally, I would think that um, perhaps if you could do a lot of a peer review in a particular area online, mm -hmm. uh, electronically, there is a potential. It becomes a lot easier. It's not a big logistic nightmare. Um, if you are doing it electronically, or oh, data, digital, well, that's really up your alley because you do a lot with prescribing data. So perhaps it's something that you could work with RACGP to, to develop a module where we can introduce peer review into general practice, starting with a defined area. And that will actually help to pick the high-hanging fruit in terms of inappropriate prescribing. Okay, well, that's... that's uh I guess some, some good advice because, of course, people can share their experience then and, and tap perhaps the tips they, they, they can share. And Sue, for you, what would you like to see if you had one thing well, in the next 12 months? Look, I think what we're looking at is behaviour change and that actually takes time. So I'm not sure about this one immediate thing. However, I would go for a little bit more regulation perhaps and I think, um, you know, as a priority, all health services and clinicians need to comply with the local prescribing guidelines, the therapeutic guidelines and the clinical care standards on antimicrobial stewardship. I mean, it's, it's a minimum. Um, uh, so that consumers and carers um, can be confident that the health care we receive is safe and evidence-based. And that's the bottom line, really. 